Hello everyone, my name is Hiba Ali. I'm a consultant anatomic pathologist or histopathologist as we say it in UK. I am a hematopathologist based in Hematological Malignancy Diagnostic Service in Leeds, United Kingdom. I'm also an RIC North Clinical Lecturer of the University of Leeds and the International Education Lead for the Royal College of Pathologists for the International Training Support Scheme and the Sponsorship Schemes for General Medical Council Registration. I welcome you all for this biopsy interpretation session, which is a collaboration between the Royal College of Pathologists and the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. So what are you going to learn today? So um, we are going to know in this session uh, what are the main diagnostic process that are used in almost all um, surgical specimens, okay? Um, so I'll go through the basics of these and um, understand some of you um, who are attending are not pathologists. So I'll use some pathology terms and I will try to make it simple. Uh, so um, it will be um, um, smooth and it will be, of course, straightforward for the established pathologist. And I'll use some easy examples of simple cases um, and show you how you can craft a clinically useful histopathology report, which is the aim of each sample you receive every day in the lab. Um, to do this, um, I'm going to follow the biopsy journey from the request form to the final report. And because, of course, I am a hematopathologist, uh, my examples uh, will be heme path cases, namely lymphoma cases. So let's start this from the end point, um, the final report. So when the report is out, and of course this is, um, you know, um, um, the final step um, of um, each case, uh, which is received or sent or emailed or uh, post to the um, clinician. So this is an example of one of our integrated reports that we have in our um, center. And by integrated, I mean, um, it has an element of uh, morphology which is the microscopy and the diagnosis, which is essential. And of course, because it's a lymphoma case, uh, we need immunohistochemistry. Uh, because this is a bit of a complex case, we also used fish present in situ um, hybridization in this case. And as every report, you will have always the request detail, the specimen details, and sometimes, which is very useful, the comments. So this was a case of a double hip lymphoma. Uh, which is a part of the high-grade B-cell lymphomas that were recently described in the revised WHO classification in 2017. And from the name of it, it's called high-grade B-cell lymphoma with MIC and BCL2 and or BCL6 rearrangements. And by rearrangements, we mean translocation, which is something that you could only arrive or identify or detect by fish. So even from the name, you will know that this is a lymphoma or an entity or a pathology that you need um, an ancillary study, which is fish in this case. So um, this is just to show you that most of our um, cases today, especially the neoplastic ones, you don't only rely on the morphology to classify it. Sometimes we need more layers for that. So other than immunohistochemistry, we need some time essential actually for diagnosis of the fish. The other bit is the immunohistochemistry, which is in most neoplastic process, you will need it. And in this report, for example, there are the phenotype um, markers that we use. So CD20 is positive, which is the lineage marker. It was CD10 positive, meaning it was a germinal center lymphoma, KI67 or MIB1 for the profession fraction. And um, it depends on the preference of the pathologist, whether to write it like this or embed it in the text of the um, report. And um, what's actually useful in this report as well is the comment to the physician. So the immunophenotype is that of this entity. The morphology describes a high-grade B-cell lymphoma. The fish detects these two rearrangements, which um, are indicative for the diagnosis. But there is also a recent study um, talking about when is this entity um, will have 
an adverse prognosis. And in this particular report, it's written here because this is a useful information that the clinician will need. So although it's not a part of the diagnosis, it's always useful to add any useful information to the clinician embedded in the report. Uh, so let's go now back to the beginning and um, follow, as I said, the biopsy journey. And in every step, I'll talk you through um, how to make sure that the end result will be a useful report. So um, it's all started when we receive a sample, which is its request form. Okay. So this is an example of request form I received. Usually there is a specimen type. It's the right axillary node in here. Um, suspected diagnosis. I hope it will be more useful than just like a query and, you know, a scared face. But that's actually sometimes is, you know, um, a clue of what the clinician already know or don't know. So in this case, they don't have any suspected or prepared or, um, you know, differential diagnosis even, okay. Um, and then um, the clinical details. So um, in this case, the clinical details are IgM paraprotein, axillary lymphadenopathy. So IgM, for example, is associated with uh, Waldstrom macroglobinemia or lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. Um, so um, I can tell from this information that I'm suspecting lymphoma and as a type of a low grade um, lymphoma, despite that there is no suspected diagnosis. Um, sometimes if they say like widespread lymphadenopathy, um, pancytopenia, um, I would know that this is actually looks like a more high grade on aggressive lymphoma. While for example, if the um, uh, suspected diagnosis or the clinical information was, um, you know, something like incidental finding during GP examination or occupation and health um, assessment. So most likely, if it's going to be a malignancy, this will be something indolent. And this applies to every um, pathology, whether that's a reactive neoplastic or a malignant or benign. So always um, um, pay attention to the details in the request form. And um, the more details are useful, of course, okay? Um, then, of course, the biopsy will be processed. And um, usually for the um, resections, it will be the second day or the day after, after fixation and the grossing or the cutoff of the sample. If it's a biopsy, if you are in the small, small lab, this will be like in the same day or sometimes the following day. And for the non pathologist in the room, um, um, this will start when, um, you know, sampling or taking the whole biopsy, if it's like, you know, a core biopsy, put it in a cassette, which will be then uh, be a tissue block um, that will be processed and embedded in certain machines. So um, the main aim of this process is to remove water from the tissue and make it as hard enough to be able um, to section it. Um, and that's by adding the paraffin or the wax, and that's the embedding um, step. After that, it will be cut in the microtome, and then it will be stained. So the usual staining is the h &E or hemipexone and eosin, and that's the gold standard of morphology. And depending if you have like a resection with a full tray, or you just have, um, you know, a biopsy, um, but you have your immunos, so it will be like also a big tray, or it's just like, you know, a duodenal biopsy or something. So you just have a couple of slides and you'll look at it under the microscope, request for the levels or request immunohistochemistry for the stains or special stains in case you're dealing with, you know, medical renal or medical liver. And then you release your final report. Sometimes it could be an interim report, but you're still waiting for, you know, further markers or more information. So um, the central um, step when the pathologist is looking at the case. Um, and as I said, the morphology is still the gold standard. So um, despite all the new ancillary and you know supporting studies that we do, which is sometimes even um, essential, not only supportive for the diagnosis, um, the cornerstone of diagnosis in HEMPAC and in every aspect of pathology remains um, the um, cytomorphology 
analysis. So under the microscope is the time when you say, oh, that looks like a carcinoma because you have glandular differentiation or they look spindle cells, so they look like sarcoma or, OK, that's a, you know, a pigmented lesion that looks like a melanoma or that's something diffuse in the lymph node looks like a lymphoma. However, this, you know, um, description could be straightforward and easy if I'm dealing with, you know, a Pandor classical example, which is, you know, that what you see in the textbook and the medical textbooks and the exams and things. But in real life, it's more complicated than this. So you don't always see like carcinoma that is, you know, um, well differentiated. We do have some poorly differentiated carcinoma that you will need immunohistochemistry to prove the lineage. Um, sarcoma is one of the difficult diagnoses, all the soft tissue tumors. Uh, melanoma is a whole wide range thing of, you know, um, diagnoses. You have a dysplastic nevi, you have, you know, things that mimickers of melanoma. And you've got different type of melanoma, superficial spreading, nevoid melanoma, all have different morphologies. And even lymphoma, which is my specialty, like you have a range from very indolent lymphoma like CLL to the most aggressive double-head lymphoma or plasmaplastic lymphoma. And they can vary extremely in the morphology, the phenotype, and even the clinical presentation. So yes, the morphology is the first step, but we'll need other um, things as well. And that just shows the diversity and of the complexity of the cases, which is the beauty of um, histopathology. So just to show you an example, um, you can see here I have two photos, and I can tell you both of these are lymphomas. And without telling you, you can, you know, at this power, um, be confident calling this a malignant neoplasm, okay? Because of course, especially this one to the right, it does look, you know, very polymorphic. The cells are very ugly. They are effacing whatever normal structure is there. There is a high degree of, you know, polymorphism. Some, you know, cells showing mitosis. Um, there is some apoptosis. Um, so this is an atypical mitotic figure. Um, uh, similar to this one, it does look more pink, and there are some multinucleated um, cells, but they be, they sorry they do look malignant. Um, they are um, bisecting between you know the background normal lymphoid tissue, so you have these small lymphocytes in the background, but whatever is there is effacing the normal architecture. So at this level, even without even without any you know history, I can say this is a pathology. Um, this is neoplastic and this is malignant. And um, this description I get is like, you know, describing different people. I mean, all of these are cells. So the, like, I always think of people like, you know, of, of cells, sorry, like different people. Yes, they all have, you know, eyes, noses, um, hair, but everyone hair is different. Everyone eyes look different, different color, different shapes, um, different sizes. And you don't know who's bad and who's good. So the same for the silk, but you can have a clue from the look. And um, that's why sometimes you need a farther level to identify, okay, what could this be? So if I tell you that both of these are anaplastic large cell lymphomas, but one is alquan positive and the other one is alquan negative. So there is no clue whatsoever on only the cytomorphology that can um, you know, um, help me distinguish between the two. It's only if I do the fish or I do the immunohistochemistry that I can arrive at this diagnosis. Yes, the phenotype by immuno could tell me this is T-cell lymphoma, this is CD30 positive lymphoma, but to know if it's ALK positive or ALK negative, that's something I can only do if I do the immunohistochemistry or the fish. So this is where immuno is really useful sometimes, actually to arrive at a diagnosis, especially in malignant cases. But I also use immunohistochemistry for benign um, conditions, for the active condition, just to show that, for example, I do have, you know, a mixture of B and T cells, or I have the normal phenotype of a certain cell. Um, so, and that does not only, you know, apply to lymphoma, even in soft tissue tumors, and even, as I said, in reactive um, um, conditions. Um, so, um, but this is the step when the immuno is really um, essential, okay? So, 
this is when we tell the patient, okay, we know um, over the phone, this is, this looks like a lymphoma, but I've requested some immunomarker either to, you know, prove the lineage or, you know, to arrive at the certain diagnosis and um, um, to differentiate between, you know, two entities. So um, this is an example here for diffuse noisy cell lymphoma. You can see the cells are very pink, they are very large, they are ugly, they look malignant. Um, so on morphology, my top differential was diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And when I did CD20, which is a pan marker for uh, B cells, so it's expressed in both the normal B cells and the neoplastic B cells. So here it's helping me in more than one aspect. So the first thing is diagnostic. So having this dark brown staining wall to wall, meaning I don't have any admixed normal T cells. So just having this diffuse infiltration, proving it by an immuno, that's helpful to prove that this is neoplastic. And having a CD20 positive in particular, which is a B cell marker, I can prove the lineage. So the marker here, I'm using it as a diagnostic tool to prove my lineage and prove that it is um, neoplastic. But also it's helpful in this situation because it's a predictive of a certain treatment. So there is an anti-CD20 um, drug, which is rituximab, that is used for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, sometimes in other B-cell lymphomas, like, for example, follicular lymphoma. So if I put in my report that this neoplasm, which is a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, is CD20 positive, then that is useful to the clinician, because if they want to give rituximab, especially if that's a follow-up case, they know that the patient will have response to this certain treatment. So in this case, my immuno was diagnostic and predictive. Sometimes it's something else. So again, this is a case of anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which is a form of an aggressive T cell lymphoma. It's a hybrid one. And you can see the cells are very big, they are pink, they have prominent nuclei, they express a marked degree of polyomorphism. So, okay, I'm dealing with a malignant um, um, thing or a malignant entity. And um, as part of my full panel, I've done the ALK1, okay, which is positive in this case. So this is here helpful as a diagnostic tool because remember two examples in the previous slides. So if that's an ALK1 positive, I will call this anaplastic large cell lymphoma ALK1 positive. And um, ALK1 here is expressed because it is um, related to a certain rearrangement, which is a translocation to 5. So this is a diagnostic marker in this um, um, step because using it, implementing an immuno here, help me to arrive at the diagnosis and differentiating the ALK negative from the ALK positive one. But also it carries a prognostic value here because it's known that the anaplastic large cell lymphomas that are ALK1 positive, they have better prognosis than the ALK1 negative ones. So having this in my report, it's a useful information for the clinician, knowing that most likely this patient will do better than the other patient. So if it was an ALK negative one, they might have a more um, close up follow up, for example, or when they discuss the diagnosis with the patient, they will let them know that this is a poor prognosis. Or if it's an ALK positive like this one, they will tell them that it carries a milder um, good prognosis or better prognosis than um, the ALK negative um, entity. So. Um, what else is helpful? So sometimes, okay, I will um, um, issue a report. I think this looks like a Burkitt's, for example, um, ileocecal valve mass or a jaw mass in a child um, that looks like lymphoma. I've seen some star sky appearances. It's a B cell lymphoma, it's a germinal center lymphoma. I think it's Burkitt's, but I have following the WHO classification to do a certain Fish test, which is the MIC IGH, because this is the defining feature to call something Burkitt's lymphoma. So sometimes mm -hmm. this is something pending or essential to arrive at the diagnosis. So this is a photo of um, um, a prop for the fish, and um, this is where you have your um, CMIC or IGH um, translocation. 
So the fish which is the fluorescence in situ hybridization can aid in identification of specific genetic abnormalities. And um, some of these are characteristic of certain neoplasm. And in case of Burkitt, for example, or in double head lymphoma, this is actually essential to call something this entity. And sometimes it just carries a prognostic significance. Um, so, for example, the um, NMIC, which is um, in neuroblastoma, that has an, an, a prognostic um, value, but it's not essential to call something neuroblastoma based on the presence of it. But this CMIC is essential for diagnosis of Burkitt's. The most important thing you have to bear in mind that a lot of these, you know, lymphomas or solid tumors or you know, even um, leukemias, when you have these genetic abnormalities and translocation, some of them are shared between different entities. So um, you always take it as part of a whole uh, picture. So, um, for example, this very example, which is um, the MEC translocation, you can see it in Burkitt lymphoma, which is essential diagnosis. You can see it in double head and triple head lymphomas. But really, you can also see it in diffuse algae cell lymphoma. So um, it's not 100% pathognomonic for Burkitt's, but it is essential for Burkitt's. And sometimes, I mean, other than when it's like a hallmark, like the Burkitt's case, um, it, it can be, um, you know, in a lymphoma, but it's not Burkitt's. Like, for example, when I said it's part of a double head lymphoma, or really you can see it, you know, in a subset of diffuse IP cell lymphoma. So I'm not going to take the translocation or the fish rearrangement in isolation and call something this um, pathology just based on that. It's always something that aids in the um, diagnosis and, you know, you always interpret it with the rest of your um, you know, ancillary studies and the clinical picture, the morphology, the immunophenotype, and everything. Another useful um, array of diagnostics um, used in pathology is the molecular, and um, in heme pathways, is most of the time the clonalities. Um, so sometimes the report is issued, but I say, okay, clonality or molecular is outstanding. So an example for this, if it's a T-cell lymphoma, uh, but I'm waiting for the clonality to prove that, you know, there is abnormal rearrangement. Um, or actually, if I'm thinking of marginal zone lymphoma, um, because it doesn't have a specific phenotype. So sometimes I rely on molecular studies, because if there is a clone that is indicative that this infiltrate is neoplastic rather than just reactive in cell adenitis, for example, um, but uh, it's important, again, like the fish, um, you don't um, um, address this in isolation or use it per se for um, a neoplastic um, diagnosis. So sometimes having something clonal doesn't mean it has to be um, neoplastic. Um, for example, plasma cells, like you could have a plasma cell infiltrate that is reactive and it can be clonal. Uh, but you could have um, a plasma cell infiltrate that is clonal and neoplastic, which is the plasma cell myeloma or the plasma cytoma. So I will also rely on the morphological features, the biochemistry uh, findings. So if the patient has paraprotein, um, clinically they have renal impairment. So all these together to arrive at um, the diagnosis. So um, then how can I classify um, a certain entity in my specialty? It would be always the lymphoma. So for example, this is um, a simple form of um, classification of lymphoma. And um, we follow the blue box or the WHO box for um, malignant um, neoplasm, um, which is in lymphoma as the revised fourth edition. And for all of the um, malignant tumors, we will have a blue book for each specialty. So that's what we follow um, for diagnosis of malignant tumors. But um, for also benign tumors, you could um, you know, use all the pathology, different textbooks, um, um, and um, benign conditions um, as well. Okay, so let's go through a specific example of lymphoma. 
and I'll try to do this example to implement what I summarized as um, diagnostic processes that we use. So how I diagnose lymphoma or how you will diagnose lymphoma. So I have three simple steps to choose a color, to identify the pattern and to play the CDs. So by choosing a color, um, so in this collage, um, I have different entities of different neoplastic and reactive uh, malignant and non-malignant um, hematopathological entities. And you can see the color range from very pink to very blue. And um, I can tell you like um, this is um, a part of nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma. This is a Hodgkin lymphoma. This is a T-cell-rich B-cell lymphoma. This is a follicular lymphoma. This is Burkitt's. This is mantle and this is CLL. But um, what do I mean by the color and why is it important? So you ask yourself when you look at the microscope, what makes something blue, blue, and what makes something pink, pink? Because that will help you identify what's the process um, is there and why is it pink or blue? And then you can narrow your differential diagnosis. So what makes anything pink that because you are seeing a lot of eucin um, it could be either because your legion cells are big and that's like in diffused like t-cell lymphoma like in this case so you have ample cytoplasm it could be because you have some degree of necrosis for um, this is for example a lung has cell histocytosis but you can also see necrosis associated with the chromatis inflammation with um, necrotic tumors and with infection um, so this is another thing for um, something to be pink. It could be also some associated features like sclerosis. And this is why this nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma is pink because I have a lot of fibrosis. Or it could be some adjacent cells that are part of um, the associated, um, you know, um, background. So in this nodular sclerosis Hodgkin, you have a lot of macrophages that are big. And you also have some eosinophils that you could see also in um, um, uh, parasitic infection, for example. What could also add to the pinkness um, is the um, uh, presence of blood vessels. So in heme path world, this would be androgen elastic T-cell lymphoma or mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, what makes something blue is if the cells themselves are small. So if I'm dealing with a low risk, small uh, B-cell lymphoma like CLL or mantle cell lymphoma. Or if it's something that's actually medium to large, but you have minimal cytoplasm, a good example is Burkitt's lymphoma. Because all what you can see is your, um, you know, um, um, nuclear chromatin material. You don't have any cytoplasm material that you could see. Um, it could be also that actually, okay, your cells are not that, uh, you know, small, the regional cells, but they are scattered and you have a lot of, you know, small lymphocytes in the background. So um, Hodgkin lymphoma is an example of this. It could look really blue. So um, by just, you know, scanning the slide at low power, I could narrow my diagnosis because, okay, this looks like blue. Okay, this looks like a monomorphic, small, low-grade B-cell lymphoma. And you could apply this for, you know, any other pathologies for other specialties, whether that's malignant, neoplastic, or even reactive. So you see a lot of eosinophils adding to the pinkness then think of parasitic infection or think of neoplasm associated with eosinophilia or mastocytosis, lung cancer, histocytosis, things like that. Um, the second thing is to identify the pattern. So each entity has its own pattern, and this is uh, especially true for neoplasm, whether they are malignant or benign. So if I'm dealing with lymphomas, um, I will always think of my common patterns so um, these are one of you know the common pattern, but this is not exclusive. So the diffuse pattern, a good example is diffuse like B cell lymphoma. So if I see something diffuse, cells look large, this will be my top differential. If something you know is a bit polymorphous, so I have large cells scattered in diffuse or nodular background, my first differential will be classical Hodgkin lymphoma. If I have something nodular or follicular, I will think of follicular lymphoma. And you will apply this for, you know, other neoplasm, other specialties. And I um, say also 
or even reactive um, conditions. So if you see like, you know, glomerulus inflammation, what you will see is a polymorphous infiltrate and you have collections of macrophages and multinucleated giant cells. So again, just be systematic in your approach of micro. Playing with the CD. So this is what we call our immunos because most of the immunos we use in lymphoma are cluster of differentiation. Um, so, um, how do I play with CD? I mean, what's the significance of this? Or is it only enough just to do CD marker like CD20 and CD3 from drinking? Could this be a T or a B cell lymphoma? I always think of immunohistochemistry as like a panel, as a, you know, a box of chocolate. So what's brown is what's positive. So some markers like the CD markers are cytoplasmic or surface markers. So I'm expecting them on the surface like CD20 whether in a normal or in a plastic um, B cell, some of them are cytoplasmic, like immunoglobulin, for example. So if I'm dealing with a plasmacytic infiltrate and I want to know if this is neoplastic or this is reactive, so I will do immunoglobulin for kappa and lambda. So if I see a mixture of these in our plasma cells, then I'm dealing with a reactive uh, plasmacytic infiltrate. But if they are all form of just lambda, expressing lambda, which is something in the cytoplasm, then I'm dealing with likely a clonal uh, plasmacytic, which is plasmacytoma or plasma cell myeloma. Um, so sometimes it could be like the nuclear um, bit. So um, this is, for example, Ki67 um, to um, estimate the perforation fraction. Is it a high grade lymphoma or a low grade lymphoma? And of course, you could apply these for other neoplasm in other specialties and in other conditions as well. So it is part of the full immuno uh, panel. So the first thing the immuno helped me is to establish the lineage. And then if there is any characteristic oncogenic proteins, for example, BCL2 in follicular lymphoma, ALK1 in a plastic life cell lymphoma, cycling B1 um, in mantle cell lymphoma. And I always use perforation characteristics, which is the MIP1 or Chi67, helping me to differentiate um, you know, the high grade from the low grade um, neoplasms. Okay, so now um, that I shared with you my approach to diagnose lymphoma, um, let's have um, an example. So this is a whole mount of a lymph node I received. And if you can guess the diagnosis, um, this is from a lady who is 50 year old, and this is an inguinal lymphadenopathy noted in the routine GP examination. So when I say that something noticed by the general practitioner, I mean the patient might um, have been there for a different um, complaint, and then um, this is something that is likely incidental. So it's just noted by her physician. It's not something that is like you know generalized lymphadenopathy. So even if I'm dealing with an informa, which I think it is. Um, my feeling would be, okay, this will be an indolent or a low-grade lymphoma because the patient didn't present in, you know, the emergency or they didn't tell you like the patient is in the ICU with widespread lymphadenopathy, B symptoms or, you know, aggressive features. So just the clinical history itself could minimize your um, differentials. So I can see from here that if I follow uh, my um, uh, steps that this is a bit purple so um, it's not very blue and it's not very uh, pink so meaning I mean the cells are a mixture of small and medium sized cells it has a nodular pattern or follicular pattern so if it's a lymphoma I'm thinking of follicular lymphoma but to arrive at this I have to um, use my imagination and compare um, this with what a reactive node looks like and the best example of reactive follicular hyperplasia is actually the tonsil, not the lymph node. So next time you see um, tonsillitis, tonsillectomy specimen, look at the beautiful follicle. So as opposed to the example I showed you, these follicles, they are like very nicely shaped. They respect each other. Um, every follicle has um, a darker zone around it, which is the mantle zone, which is preserved, which is something I didn't see in that example from the GP. And at higher power, you can easily see the white areas, which are the tangible body macrophages, which is um, a good clue of the um, follicle being reactive. So this 
is an example of reactive follicular hyperplasia where I have centroblast, centrocytes, so mixture of cells, mantle zone preserved, tangible body macrophages. And if I do immunohistochemistry, there is actually zonation. So there is a low profession area and high profession area, and this is what we call polarization. And this is a sign that this is a secondary fault of this is reactive. I didn't see this in that example of the GP sent me. So I think what I've seen is neoplastic. The follicles are variable in size. They are back to back. They don't respect each other. But I have to prove this that in you, and that's what I did. So these are my follicles that are you know, um, not nice in shape. Um, they are CD20 positive, so whatever neoplasm I'm dealing with is a B-cell neoplasm. So um, more markers to prove the lineage and the specific entity. So CD10 is a germinal center marker, and we know that follicular lymphoma is a germinal center lymphoma. BCL6 is another germinal center marker, and BCL2, which is here differentiating the neoplastic process from being reactive because in a normal or a reactive follicle it should be negative but it's here positive so that's prove my um, um, differential that this is a follicular neoplasma neoplasm sorry and this is malignant uh, but I always think that it's good to go to your textbooks and or immunohistochemistry textbook and know the rationale or the basis of the rather than just you know try to memorize the phenotype so i'll just give you an example and this is an illustration of the depreciation of the b cell the normal b cell and you could um guess that um if you have a neoplasm of a b cell it will try to mimic its normal counterpart so every b cell starts in the bone marrow as a pro b or a stem cell and uh, you will have these primitive mismarkers the td10 tdt and 34 but then you start gaining the pan b markers so you start with the 1979a pax5 and cd20 later in its life and after that the differentiation actually happens in the germinal center so uh, your b cell starts to gain 10 and bcl6 after leaving the germinal center they start gaining the R4 or MUM1. Actually, the term MUM1 is multiple myeloma marker because initially it was described in plasma cell myeloma, but now we know it's expressed in all post-germinal center B cells, whether they are, react they are reactive, neoplastic, or normal. And then the ultimate um, form of any B cell is a plasma cell, which is an undividing immunoglobulin producing cell. So you have some specific plasma cell marker. These are CD38, CD138, and BLIMP1. So if I have a neoplasm arising from this point, which is the germinal center, you would expect it to be CD10 and BCL6 positive and positive for PAN-B markers, including CD20. And this is the case of my follicular lymphoma. It was positive for CD20, CD10, BCL6, plus the aberrant expression of BCL2. And this could also be the case if you have a diffuse large B cell lymphoma that is germinal center subtype. So knowing the basics of immunohistochemistry um, could help you understand what panel to use and why you have this phenotype in particular. And you could apply this, of course, in all other neoplasms and um, other conditions as well. So. Um, I know that this is now follicular lymphoma, and I want to issue the report for the GP or physician. So it's not only just enough to call it follicular. I do have subtypes and other entities. And this is important because you could have the same morphology, but in different signs, so you call them something different. So I know that there are some types of um, follicular have good prognosis, namely the duodenal or the intestinal type. Also, the in situ follicular neoplasia, which is like a very early, subtle form of uh, follicular lymphoma, and it's usually very incidental. Um, you can also have some with adverse outcomes. So, follicular lymphoma has grading, and if it's grade 3B, this is technically a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, the patient will be treated accordingly. And you can also have follicular lymphoma that is transformed to diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So in that case, this is a high-grade lymphoma and no longer just um, a low-grade lymphoma. So knowing which sub-entity it is and the variant is really important. And this is why we refer also to the WHO box, the blue box. Okay, So in my case, it will be the HEMPATH WHO book. And
And this point exactly emphasizes the importance of correlation with the clinical information. Because if I didn't know that this is presenting in the duodenum, the morphology is the same. So I could call it follicular lymphoma, but actually this is a subtype of follicular lymphoma. So I always say that lymphoma and all other pathologies actually are clinical context sensitive diagnoses. So in that example, whatever I had was an inguinal lymph node, looks like follicular lymphoma, so I'll just call it the systemic usual follicular lymphoma. But if I have the same morphology, same phenotype, but in a polyp, a localized disease in the intestine, that will be a duodenal type follicular lymphoma, which is a specific variant, and usually the patient will not need treatment and it's an excellent prognosis. So it's important to have the request form populated by as much information as you can, and this is, will be very useful to arrive at the right diagnosis. Another example, um, which is the history of the patient. For example, I have here something that looks like diffused IBC lymphoma, and the brown stain here is LMP1, which is an EBV staining. I have a similar picture with something that look, looks like a diffused IBC lymphoma with some necrosis, but here I have this blue staining is the EBOL, which is another EBV positive um, staining. The only difference between these two cases at the bottom is one patient is a transplant recipient and the other patient didn't have any immunodeficiency or PL lymphoma. So although they are both diffused IBC lymphoma and they are both EBV positive, one case I will call it post-transplant this uh, lymphopositive disorder diffuse large B, and the other is EBV positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma and OS. Why does this matter? Because although they will both receive the same treatment, which is systemic treatment, they might consider in the post transplant patient, um, you know, um, lowering the dose of an, uh, immunosuppressant if they are still on it, especially if that's like very soon after the transplant. The other thing is the prognosis is different. So. A simple um, information um, that is provided by your clinician could alter the diagnosis. So uh, this is important to know what prior treatment the patient had, prior surgeries, uh, prior in information about their medical history. Um, so any prior tumors is um, helpful as well. So and that's like now I'm talking generally, not only in lymphomas. So type, site, date, removal, stage of disease, because you know that there are some, you know, adenomas, for example, can develop to carcinoma. So if I have, you know, a history of the patient has a previous chronic adenoma, and then I have something that looks like adenocarcinoma, that this the natural uh, progression of the disease. Um, current or recent pregnancy, pregnancy-related changes can mimic malignancy with the, um, you know, um, sort of visualization changes in the endometrium, for example, or if the patient has endometriosis and then they are on certain treatment or pregnancy, then you can see some visualization changes on the cells that, you know, make them different from the usual morphology. Immune status, and um, an example is just that EBV positive diffuse like B-cell lymphoma versus post-transplant lymphopoietic disorder. So both of them are lymphomas, but um, there are two different entities, and it's only the history of transplant that makes you choose this or that diagnosis. Also, um, the patient being immunocompromised, that means they are vulnerable to certain neoplasms and also some opportunistic infections as well. So you look carefully for fungal infections in skin for patients who are transplanted, um, certain diseases like, you know, grass versus host disease in transplant patients. So um, just, you know, um, thinking of what potentially could be in that situation related to that history. And continuing is the previous treatment effect. So radiation or chemotherapy, um, you will always have these treatment changes morphologically. Sometimes can be mistaken for malignancy because of the cytomorphology morphology changes. Sometimes the identification of the tumor bed is important to assess the response of the treatment. And this is typically true, for example, in uh, breast carcinomas. Um, drug use that can alter histological appearances of the tissue, especially important in evaluation of liver and endometrial biopsies. So, um, you know, certain um, um, drugs can um, make the endometrium look like more proliferative or more 
um, atrophic, um, depending on the hormonal changes um, according to that um, um, drug. Also, if I'm talking about um, lymphoma, um, I, I mentioned the rituximab, which is an anti-CD20. So sometimes patients who receive this treatment in their follow-up biopsies, the CD20 will be lost because they received something against it. So I need to do more markers to prove the lineage, like CD79A, for example. And sometimes drug um, uh, that are used um, could make the patient susceptible to unusual infections. And we mentioned that as part of the immunosuppressant. So um, steroids, chemotherapy, uh, antibacterial or antifungal um, therapy. So just to highlight that, um, you um, need to um, integrate all this information, the previous history, previous biopsies, um, previous diagnoses, your morphology, your ancillary study, your systemic approach to um, the biopsy. And you took all of this and, you know, summarize it in a single useful report. So speaking about what a good report could be. And um, I always this, use this illustration. Um, so just think about you are answering uh, a clinician query, okay? You are writing to the clinician. If you are confident with the diagnosis, so in my case, I mean, they are saying query lymphoma, okay? Could this be a lymphoma? So if I give them an answer, no, there is no evidence of lymphoma, or yes, this is follicular lymphoma, they will be happy because that's what they actually need. Now, if I offer two differential diagnoses, they start to get bored. So if I say, oh, this could be actually um, follicular lymphoma, but it could be follicular hyperplasia, especially if your differential one of them is malignant versus benign. Or even if I say, oh, I'm not sure this is a follicular lymphoma or a marginal lymphoma, it could be either or because prognosis and treatment could differ. So mm, not happy. And But then if I offer more than two differentials saying, oh, that's a poorly differentiated neoplasm, it could be lymphoma, it could be melanoma, it could be zen, okay, they will be upset. Um, and that's because like you are not helping them to um, you know, plan a management for the patient. Of course, I understand that sometimes some cases are very complicated, some cases are tricky, and you cannot arrive at a diagnosis. But um, I know most of you will ask then um, when to be confident and when to sit on the fence and say, okay, the differential includes. Because, I mean, real tumors and, um, you know, um, pathologies, I mean, they don't read books. So you can't always see a very classical example, like a textbook example every time. So my approach to this is um, to know how confident you should be or when to, um, you know, give a one single diagnosis and when to offer differential is to ask or solve these three questions. So the first question is, what does the clinician already know? And then why is this biopsy sample or the section taken? And how to be helpful to the clinician? So let's say, for example, just to change from the lymphoma, a colonic polyp, okay? So you receive the chronic polyp, GI uh, pathology, and you ask yourself, what does the clinician already know? So they've done endoscopy or colonoscopy, and they know there is a polyp. So they already know it's a polyp, and it's a chronic polyp, and it could be either benign or malignant. So sitting on the fence and saying, oh, this is a polyp, but I'm not sure if this is adenoma or hyperplastic, you are not helpful at all, because this is what the already already the clinician knows, okay, that this could be a benign or malignant, and clinically and chronoscopically, they know that this is a polyp. Um, so just to be fair, just like, you know, what I say, you know, helping the trainees in the exam preparation, the pass mark is to say whether this benign or malignant. So, okay, this is not adenocarcinoma, this is not invasive carcinoma, but this is tubular adenoma, which is a precancerous thing. So this is now you are just, you know, giving a fair, confident diagnosis, which you need, because I want to know if this is, you know, malignant or benign, and if it's, you know, um, you know, dysplastic, which is like, you know, um, adenoma, is that this a tubular adenoma with low grade, or is just, you know, a villous adenoma, is there any high grade dysplasia in it? So now I'm classifying it. Now, how to be more helpful to the clinician, you know, to subtype it and 
say if it's a villainous ignore to say if it is a high grade displays your focal if it is focal invasion whatever because if it's you know removed and whether it's suicide or not if that's you know um, um completely removed and you could apply this you know to a malignant uh, sorry um, um a pigmented lesion so they know this is a pigmented lesion is this is melanoma or not so you always try to say this is melanoma or no this is a dysplastic nervous like this and you could apply these three questions to every case you receive on a daily basis okay and as i said again of course there are very complicated cases that you need to discuss in your tumor boards or multidisciplinary meetings you need to pick up your phone and talk to the clinician about these cases and sometimes there are like other artifacts that you know, minimizing your interpretation or limiting the assessment. For example, if it was poorly preserved, um, received without fixation, there is crushing certain, you know, biopsies like EUS biopsies, EUS biopsies. So, but you could at least give them what is minimal, safe, and correct information. So, okay, I have a medicinal mass. It does look like a lymphoma, but it could be a Hodgkin lymphoma or a primary medicine. So I would say this is a lymphoma within the limitation. This could be either or, but I'm favoring this. And then they could correlate with the radiological features because Hodgkin versus medicinal, they have different you know, radiological distribution clinically and the age of the patient. And then the clinician will decide if they will provide you with a repeat biopsy or they could just read based on the information you have. So you'll always have exceptions to the rule, but just always try to ask yourself all these three questions in every um, case and with that i end my presentation thank you so much for listening um, um and i'm grateful for my colleague honey and melody for her beautiful illustrations that she shared with me um a suggested reading is uh, the textbook um that i found useful in my training which is Manual of Surgical Pathology. So the first 10 chapters are mainly about management and processing. And the other part two is about specific cut up or grossing and examples of how to craft your report. So I um, strongly recommend it. Um, if you have any questions, please share with me. And if you would like to connect, this is my LinkedIn and Twitter accounts. Um, thank you so much.